So uh, we're speaking to co-author Lisa Vesterlund. Uh, she's the co-author of the book, The No Club, Putting a Stop to Women's Dead End Work. And we've discussed the negative ramifications of saying yes to non-promotable tasks in the workplace. Those ramifications um, impact not just uh, the person's career, but also uh, personal life as well because of being overburdened with all these tasks, all this work that doesn't even necessarily translate to a promotion or a better paying job. And I wanna talk about solutions now because this is where things could get a little risky depending on who your employer is. You know, There's this expectation, especially for women to pick up the slack and say yes to non-promotable tasks in the workplace. To counter that, to mitigate that, to prevent that, what do you propose workers and women in particular do? So I think the first step is to figure out what is promotable and non-promotable. You know, sort of get a clear sense of what is the work that I should be doing to get to the career that I really want. The second step is then to figure out what is it that I need to say no to and yes to, and change the way that you say yes and no. So um, what many of us tend to do when we think about saying no is that we don't immediately go to thinking about offering a solution to the person who's requesting help. And what they really want is help. So Explaining why you can't do the work and proposing a solution in the form of somebody else doing the work. Making clear that the reason why you have to say no is that you can't work on the product launch. That's why you can't work on you know, a less important task so that you make clear what are the costs of you taking on that work. So changing the way that we say no is the first step. Another step is to change the way that you say yes. You don't just have to say yes to an assignment. You can negotiate that assignment by saying, okay, I will take on this work if you can take off this other non-promotable assignment that I already have. Um, Another opportunity is to suggest that you do it this time, but not uh, next time that you have a clear path for for getting off uh, the assignment or that you even look at the assignment and say, this is a really big assignment. How about if we divvy it into three different components and I do a component A and Jim and Bill will do the two other components. So changing the way that you say yes is, is another way of doing this. But in general, it isn't just a question of sort of changing what you do. It is a question of seeding change within the organization by bringing attention to all the non-promotable work that women end up doing. So. Uh, next time you come into a meeting and they ask for a volunteer, say, "Oh, you know, I, I read this study. It turns out that if you ask for a volunteer, women are 50% more likely to take on the assignments. Why don't we just put names into a hat and randomly assign it? Or why don't we take turns?" So these small changes can sort of stir up these expectations uh, that we all hold of women taking on this work. And can gradually get us to a point where we are more aware of the non-promotable work um, sort of ending up with the women. You know, one of the things though that to be quite honest with you bothers me is how much of the onus is placed on the workers to you know figure out ways to communicate, uh, figure out ways to delegate these non-promotable tasks. Uh, but something that really stands out to me is the fact that these employers just refuse to hire people to do these jobs specifically. So for instance, you know, I was listening to a talk that one of your co-authors was giving in regard to this book. And she specifically gave the example of women working in academia and how they end up doing all sorts of administrative work. And what I kind of fail to understand is, why not hire someone who is dedicated to getting the administrative work done? Um, so what are your thoughts on that? And, and are you noticing that issue with employers where they're trying to like save money? So they're just kind of like throwing all this extra work onto their employees. No, so that's definitely you know hiring administrative assistants to hire to doing the administrative work uh, would be a benefit to the women, but it certainly would also be a benefit to the organization. You know, having you know certainly in academia you have a highly paid a faculty member who is spending time on somebody on work that an administrative assistant could do much more cheaply. But I think part of the challenge is that we haven't paid attention to this. It's that the employer doesn't know exactly what it is that we're doing. And bringing up this conversation about 
what are we doing? How much time are these talented women spending on non-promotable work? You know, I, I think one of the striking things uh, under 200 hours that we found was that when we looked at more senior women, they were also doing 200 more hours of non-promotable work, but they were doing the same amount of promotable work. So they were just working crazy hours to fit in all this work where many of the assignments really could have been handled by somebody at a lower rank. So you don't wanna have a senior woman who is highly skilled spending her time on work that could have been handled by somebody at a lower rank and for whom the work actually could have been promotable. Yeah, one of your findings that I thought was so fascinating was, you know, when comparing men and women in regard to their, you know, willingness to take on this work, women are actually way more willing to raise their hand and volunteer for that non-promotable work. Can you talk about the difference between men and women in, in regard to how they handle those requests and even, you know, how rejecting those requests looks for a male versus female in the workplace? Yeah, so one of the studies we have is where we sort of try to mirror what happens when you come into that dreaded meeting where a supervisor comes in with an assignment that nobody wants to do, but everybody knows that has to be done and that it will be benefit the entire organization if it gets done. And what we see in that setting, we all we all know how it plays down. You know, the supervisor asks, suddenly everybody acts as if they can't really hear, they're checking their phones, they seem distracted. <laughs> And some reluctant volunteer has to take it on. And what we see in our studies is that women are 50% more likely to raise their hands in this setting. Hmm. Um, and the intriguing part about that is that they're not raising their hands because they're certainly not in our study. Uh, this is a study where there's no difference in skill. Um, so it's not because they're better at it. And we also show it's not because they care more about getting the work done because when we then compare what happens in an all female group to an all male group, we see that groups of all women volunteer at exactly the same rate as groups of all men. So it's not that the men don't know how to volunteer, it's just they don't volunteer unless the women are in the group. Or they don't volunteer as long as the women are in the group. So it's really coming from this gender composition. When there are men and women in the group, men and women expect the women to step up and take on the work. And that expectation plays over even when the manager gets to ask someone to take on the work because managers who look at male and female employees are far more likely to ask the female employees to take on an assignment than they are, a non-promotable assignment than they are to ask a male employee. So these expectations are really critical when we're sitting in these situations and somebody has to take an assignment that helps out the team because we all expect women to do it. They know that they have to step up and take the, the assignment for the team. And final question for you. I know that this wasn't the purpose of the book, but I am curious about your thoughts. Uh, you know, what do you think about efforts to unionize in various workplaces in the country right now? You know, the United States uh, used to have a pretty strong and militant um, labor movement that's died down significantly. But now we're starting to see this reemergence of labor militancy. I'd like to see a lot more of it to be quite honest with you. But I, I wanna get your thoughts on whether that could also be a solution to kind of mitigate what you're noticing with uh, all of this uh, non-promotional work uh, that women are taking on. I mean, it's it's a very unique time that we're in right now because suddenly uh, labor is in super high demand. We've had this great resignation. We have the great reshuffling. And workers finally have an opportunity to demand things that they have never been able to demand before. Um, I don't know if the unions uh, is there. Are certainly many things that can come through uh, the unions. I don't know if this is a way uh, of attacking this. I, I Certainly what we've seen in the organizations we have worked with is that once they realize how large the gap is, that they themselves recognize that this is not in their interest. So while there's sort of a very strong fairness case for, for doing something in, in terms of how we distribute work, there's also a strong business case. The businesses are hurting themselves by doing this. So Perhaps the unification can help um, can help the organizations and the employers come together and understand this better. So, you know, I'm hopeful that our book will will make everybody open their eyes and recognize that this is in their interest to fix this. 
Um, but perhaps the unions um, are a way of bringing attention to this. I, I, I think the unions uh, in most places are working on um, sort of very easy to measure issues like pay and diversity, equity and inclusion. Um, but certainly by fixing and making sure that we get equal opportunities to work on promotable assignments and demonstrating our skills. Many of those differences are going to fall into place. Um, certainly uh, women uh, would be more likely to be more attached to the labor market. What we're seeing very disturbingly is that women of color are hit far more severely uh, by these non-promotable assignments. So mm -hmm. um, bringing it down to looking at assignments uh, might be the way to do it. All right. Uh, Lisa Vesterlund, co-author of the book, The No Club, Putting a Stop to Women's Dead End Work. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. I really appreciate it and I hope you come back soon. Uh, thank you for having me on the show. Of course.